Hello, my name is Dr. Paul Friedman, uh, Chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine, and welcome to Interview with the Experts, where we highlight an important cardiovascular topic of the day and discuss it with an expert for about 10 minutes uh, to update all of us. It's my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. Patricia Pelica, cardiologist, expert imager, vice chair in our department. And uh, today we're going to talk about COVID-19 and the significance of cardiac involvement. Patty, welcome. Thank you, Paul. So uh, let's start with some of the basics. First of all, what's the significance of cardiac involvement in COVID-19? We typically think about lung disease. Yes, that's a great question. The early reports from Wuhan pointed out that patients with underlying cardiovascular disease, including even just hypertension or risk factors for cardiovascular disease, uh, had a higher risk of morbidity and mortality. We've also come to recognize that patients with evidence of cardiac disease during their COVID episode, and that is often defined by an elevated troponin or with imaging with new regional wall motion abnormalities or ventricular dysfunction, those patients also had a higher morbidity and mortality during their COVID hospitalization. And this is short-term events um, during that hospitalization. Hmm. So in other words, if you have pre-existing heart disease, you're at higher risk should you get COVID. And then some people get COVID-related cardiac involvement. How do we diagnose that? So the most common method of diagnosing uh, cardiac disease has been just measuring troponin. But of course, that is such a sensitive biomarker that it goes up in many patients um, with who are in intensive care units just because of hemodynamic instability, even if their primary problem is not cardiac. Echocardiography has been most widely utilized for detecting cardiac dysfunction in patients with COVID-19 because of its convenience and portability. We've seen that there have been some people who come to the hospital, looks like they're having an acute myocardial infarction and in fact, it's a COVID infection and the coronaries are unremarkable. Any comments on that? So cardiac injury in COVID is very interesting. COVID-19 results in a release of um, pro-inflammatory cytokines that affect the myocardium. Um, and so we initially thought that there would be a lot of myocarditis going on with COVID-19, but actually in patients who have had biopsy and have come to post-mortem examination, myocarditis has not been particularly common. There can be um, thrombosis of um, tiny vessels in the lungs and probably also in the heart. But more often we have seen non-ST elevation myocardial infarction in patients with COVID-19 and it's probably, and also um, type two infarctions, patients with uh, just intense hemodynamic stress that causes troponin elevation and might cause exacerbation of underlying ischemic heart disease. So there really is a stress on the right heart that is, um, that is caused by the COVID-19 infection of the lungs and patients get ARDS. Um, they may have shock. They might require mechanical ventilation, which also has its effects on the right heart. And then we have myocardial injury and ischemia, some myocarditis. We've also seen patients with stress cardiomyopathy, the typical Takotsubo related to COVID. Now, there have been a, a number of reports um, talking about this issue of MRI identified myocarditis and maybe in, in people who are less critically ill. Um, how often is that an issue? How often should we look for it? Um, and what are the implications for the, the person today who may have COVID disease, but isn't even hospitalized? That's an interesting and controversial point, Paul. The, I think we're still learning a lot about this. Some of the papers about um, my, um, MRI abnormalities in patients with a history of COVID have been criticized because of varying criteria that have been used to classify um, inflammation on those studies. 
But it is interesting that some healthy young people who did not even require hospitalization had subtle abnormalities that were detected by MRI. There are also, as you know, increasing reports about patients uh, who seem to have recovered from their COVID-19, but still have some lingering effects, um, fatigue, exertional dyspnea, um, and, and we still have a lot to understand about those. There really is a, a lot of interest now in this issue of long haulers COVID. People who have COVID, as you mentioned, they seem to get better, but, and it comes in various varieties. Some can be a brain fog, some can be this marked fatigue. Um, often it's non-specific sorts of things. And, and my question is, do you have a handle on, in someone with those, in we'll say long haulers COVID, um, symptoms, when would you consider cardiac evaluation appropriate? You know, I think cardiac evaluation would be reasonable for anyone who has um, um, persistent symptoms or decline in their exercise capacity. And, and this might be evaluated objectively with an exercise test to see if it is abnormal, if the patient is able to exercise for what is expected for their age and sex. Um, we might even be able to apply artificial intelligence to detect subclinical forms of heart disease by evaluating uh, the electrocardiogram. Um, you've been involved with that work to detect left ventricular dysfunction, but also with our more sensitive tools with echocardiography, including strain rate imaging of the left and right ventricle. So how would you see that working? The uh, artificial intelligence is uh, very exciting to a lot of people. Maybe tell us a little bit more about some of the AI work as it pertains to ECG or echo, where you've been doing some work. So with our echo work in patients with COVID-19, um, our echocardiograms were initially very abbreviated examinations um, at the patient's bedside. And they were not as uh, thorough and comprehensive as our usual echocardiograms, we noted that features that identified patients with worse short-term outcomes were the elevated troponin, elevated D-dimer, and also uh, elevated right ventricular systolic pressure. But we did not apply strain and strain rate imaging to those images because um, we did not do an electrocardiogram, um, apply electrocardiographic leads to our patients. So it was a very abbreviated study. But we are now interested in looking at the echocardiograms before and after uh, the diagnosis of COVID and using some of these um, more sensitive techniques to see if we can detect changes. Oh, great. So any any uh, closing comments on things for the uh, general practitioner in terms of um, what would you say the, the key points to think about with regards to COVID and heart disease, maybe the top takeaway points? Well, ca uh, cardiovascular disease um, certainly is an important thing to detect in patients with COVID-19. It does uh, Patients with underlying heart disease seem to have worse outcomes. And also patients who have evidence of cardiac involvement with new wall motion abnormalities or right ventricular dysfunction seem to have worse short-term outcomes. We're still sorting out what the long-term effects of COVID-19 are and which patients require imaging and will need long-term follow-up. There's still a lot to learn. And I hope that AI and a systematic review of our data will provide those clues. Well, thank you. Um, and as you know, Mayo Clinic has uh, developed a long haulers clinic specifically for COVID patients, and hopefully we will continue to learn how to best manage and triage these patients. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Uh, such a, a complex area where we've um, gotten a lot of experience in a short term, and hopefully that experience will start to decline, but with the long term, there will be much to do. Dr. Pelica, thank you so much for a very informative interview. Thank you.